Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. I am so excited about what we're getting ready to do right now. I pray that you enjoy that tribute, amen, as we honor all women, amen. We thank God for you, and we want you to know that you are special and you are appreciated, amen. And at this time, we're getting ready to take this thing to another level as I want to give the scripture reference first. Scripture references that we're coming from it's Genesis chapter number three, and also John chapter 16. In Genesis chapter three, verse number 15, reads as follows. God says, I will put enmity, he was speaking to Satan, between thee and the woman, between her seed and thy seed. Your seed will bruise his heel, but he shall bruise your head. So now we realize from that moment God put enmity between Satan and the woman. Enmity is hostility. So we understand why Satan hates women. Because God used you as the door that he would come through to defeat Satan Amen. and put him back in his place. And the next scripture we're looking at is John chapter 16 verse 21 that brings us into our text today in this informal delivery of a message. In John 16 and 21, he says, and the woman has travail and, 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 and she's in pain until she gives birth because her hour has come. But oh, when she delivers that child, she no more remembers the pain or the anguish for the joy that she's birthed the child into this world. And what we want to talk about these next few minutes is the birthing process. And to help me with that, I have an amazing woman that I'm going to interview that I think her life and her journey is the epitome of the birthing process. So with no further ado, help me welcome the one and only greatest woman on the planet, my lovely wife. First Lady Doran Collins. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Listen, for many of you who don't know, there's a book that she's going to be finishing and getting published real soon, and it gives a, a breakdown of her life. And of course, I've had the privilege of reading it and seeing it in its process. So I'm, I have a lot of inside information, but in this moment, I want to allow her to share her story as we interview her and just listen to the plight of women and all that they sometimes go through, but knowing that the birthing process always ends better than it ever began. Amen. It ever began. So thanks again, Sugar, for being here in this space with me. I'm so excited to talk with you and interview you in this capacity. So let's just begin with a little bit about yourself. I understand that you didn't grow up in this country. You're from Belize, is it? Yes, I'm from Belize. Um, so I want to start off by thanking you for this opportunity because my story and your story is for someone else to help inspire them, to, um, to help them to have a voice that they can too come forward and, and talk about their story. Um, you know, God has brought us through these situations. He never left us um, where, you know, we were. And so um, I'm happy to be here. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Wonderful. So, and when we talk about Belize, now it's not just that you're from another country, but my understanding, you grew up in a village where yes. things that we take for granted, like running water, electricity, you didn't have these bare what we consider necessities, correct? Right. Explain right. what that was like. Well, growing up in a village, I mean, uh, without electricity, running water, no stove, no refrigerator, I was adapted to that lifestyle. So at that wow. time and point, I didn't know anything was missing from my life. Wow. Um, my dad, we dug a well, and when that well would run dry, we would walk a couple miles to a pump, get the water, and um, the sunlight would be where we put the buckets out to warm the water until wow. evening time. So um, we grew most or everything that we ate. We raised animals and um, 
Wow. It was really, really. Um, and is it true that y'all didn't have money? I'm not saying you were poor. I'm saying literally didn't have money, period. Yes, yes, we didn't have money. So what we did in the village, we had something called harvest. Yes. So each month, all the families, it was like eight families in this village, and we lived miles apart. And all the families would come to this church in the village that we turned into, well, it turned into a school and a church. On the weekend, it was a, a church, and during the week, it was a school. So we would all come to the school, and we would all have all the, heart, the crops that we grew or whatever we grew from, the, from our farms, and we would exchange. So we would go around and exchange all the, um, the crops and stuff like that. So that's how we would actually get what, something else that we didn't have in our farm. So, wow. yes. yes. That's incredible. You really traded. Traded. So, so right. your crops and all of this was your money. Yes. So like, is this like if you grew potatoes and I grew peas, I will give you so many peas for some of your potatoes? Yes, yes. Or for services, we would give something like an animal or even, oh. yeah, even or uh, crops that we grew. My dad was actually working in the city. We would see him on the weekends. Um, wow. We didn't know that he was really working to get us out of the village, so, mm. yeah. Man, this is incredible. Like, I know it was fascinating as you shared, like even your school, the type of classes that you took, wasn't just reading and math. You took classes to learn about animal yes. sounds and danger? Survival. They teach us survival skills, how to identify songs of different animals, the smell, um, and what to do if we would get like a, uh, for example, snake bite or bee sting or, and all that stuff. And even our parents would be educated enough to also teach us growing up as a small child, yeah. That's crazy. That's a class. What, yes. Which berries you can eat, which ones you can't eat, Correct. what this sound means, stay away, or what this yes. smell means. Wow. Yes. yes. There was definitely a different upbringing. So how long did this last? Like, were you there? Because I think you shared the fact that you were left there in the village once. Your parents yes. left you for a period of time. Well, I was a little girl. I overheard my parents How talking. many of you were? It was eight at that time. The total afterwards is ten. Wow. I um, overheard my parents talking in the room, talking about they were going to the state to try to work and make money, but I didn't understand what state The state's being. being the United States. Yes, because okay. I'd never been out of the village, so I didn't know anywhere else. Um, and so I was a little confused, and the day after, they had sat us down and let us know that they were going to go away and leave us with our grandmother, um, our family members, that uh, take care of us until they get back. I didn't know how long. I thought it was just gonna be like for a week. We was, as younger kids, we didn't understand that part. Wow. Yeah. And I understand that some of that time, cause they were gone for a pretty good while. And yes. you guys suffered some yes. very traumatic events during that time. Yes, so um, I don't remember how old I was, but I know I was pretty young when they left. Um, and we stayed with some family members. Um, we ended up staying with family members. And the things that occurred there was very traumatic um, growing up. I, I remember my mom uh, talking about before we left, oh, you know, about God. She didn't know that much, but she told us, you know, your invisible friend, he's everywhere with you. And so that, one, that stuck with me that I could have talked to God, somebody I couldn't see. Wow. And it felt like a play friend, someone you know, and I would talk to him and I would be like, but some of the things that I endure was actually burning. Uh, we would have uniforms long, so they would, the person would burn, leave, you know, burn my like leg with fire stick when they would get What's mad. A fire or stick? A fire stick is what we put in the fireplace. And I remember my twin brothers, they were babies at that time. So uh, the first week, they would pee on the floor. They had di not pampers, but clot diapers. And so I remember them peeing on the floor, and this family member got so upset, and they took all of our belongings that my parents gave us and locked us up in a house by ourselves. And we couldn't get out the house. It was a lock outside. I remember a small little window on top uh, in the house. There was no bathroom, so we had to use the corner to go. And I remember we used to push, because we used to be so hungry, going to bed. 
we would push my brother through that little window so he could stone mangoes. Um, and he would be outside in the dark, just scrambling and throwing any kind of mangoes inside. And I remember one night, my brother, I felt something warm on me and I just like pushed him away, not knowing that he was choking in his sleep, he was throwing up. And that push that I gave him really saved him because he was actually throwing up and he got up. And, and so it was, just, it was just horrible that we, you know, the, um, the lifestyle. And all of y'all were in this? All of us in a big wooden bed, no blankets, no sheets, no pillows, and we just have to warm ourselves with our body come together, yes. And this type of torture went on frequently? Yes, it went on for a while. I remember my brother, one of my brothers, um, just chipped one of my family member tree and she asked for ropes and we didn't know what she was talking about. She called all of us outside and she said, I'm gonna set an example today so you don't chip my tree, just a little chip off the tree and she, Stretch, they stretched my brother outside like Jesus on the cross without his foot touching the ground and he would be out there all day in the sun. Wow. Um, so it was just a lot. They never took care of my twin brothers. Uh, one of the things that took me throughout the day at school was, was remembering my, my brothers, the little babies I used to take care of them with their hands reaching out to me was one of the things that really motivate me to keep going. And it's not like we could go to the neighbors and tell them what's going on, or it felt like we was trapped. Like we, and it was just so horrifying that I thought that my parents abandoned us. We would write them letters. My parents um, told this person, this family members, you know, I'll write letters and let them write letters back. We'll send stuff around Christmas and around birthdays and we'd write letters but we never received anything we would never receive nothing and I, we were keeping talking among ourselves as brothers and sisters like wow how could our parents just leave us like this right. and no reply no f nothing we didn't have phones so i didn't expect them to call but no letters or and or letters i don't I come to find out in the end it was just it was just a lot um, we would so, see barrels come and clothes for Christmas, and okay. we were so excited. We'd be like, wow, mom, okay, now she remembers us. And, you know, and so when Christmas came, all the rest of the cousins would end up, you know, and we were right there happy, we couldn't wait. And the barrel, not knowing that barrel was empty, they are giving out clothes, toys to other kids, and we never got anything. So it was just another let so who was the barrel you know, from? from our parents come to, we didn't know then, but my parents, one day my mom just showed up. There was a vehicle that pulled up and I saw her and I just run. I like just dropped everything and we, I just started like screaming to my brothers and we run over to her and she was so horrified with the way that we looked and, and how malnutrition we were. And wow. And uh, I heard her, I stood by her side when she was talking to this person, this family member. And she was like, I, I was just worried that, you know, all my letters, I haven't received anything from my children. I didn't, had no way to contact to see how they were doing. And so I just, just decided to just come and see what's going on. But y'all have been writing her letters all the time. Yes. And they weren't being sent to No. Her? So I didn't know that she was writing us letters. That's when I found out. St standing there by her side talking to this family member. And, and the barrel. And the barrels and all that stuff. When she saw us with all the tour clothes and stuff, she was so disappointed. She said, um, afterwards she told us that she sent barrels, she sent birthday gifts, she sent different stuff, and we and never received never nothing. never got any of it. Yes, never. So that day she just <sighs> left everything behind and she just took us to another family member house. Were things better there? It was better. It was better. But my gra um, it was better. My family member, it was uh, torture. It was unnecessary for the things that we endure at that particular house. Wow. It was aunt's nest that they would like to discipline us. They would put certain of my brothers or sisters in aunt's nest. Inside of the yes, ant bed? Yes. To allow the ants to. Yes. Wow. Yes. Wow. So I know this didn't go on forever. Like, 
you eventually came even out of the village, right? You mm -hmm. eventually saw technology because at this point you really hadn't experienced technology. Yeah. Um, I remember my dad, this was rewinding back before they left. Okay. My dad wanted to introduce us to actually television and electricity. So he, he bought this little black and white TV and we didn't understand what he was doing, plugging up stuff. And then we started hearing voices. We didn't see anything. It was like a lot of static was <laughs> like making that noise. And then we started hearing some voices. And so we start looking behind the TV. I'm like, Okay, how, how is a big person going to fit behind, in there? <laughs> so we keep, and my dad had to explain to us. We didn't see nothing. We just heard voices. Wow. Um, and he explained that this is television and try to get us used to stuff before we go out of the village. That was wow. his plan. And That's um, crazy. Yeah, the first time I actually like, see light, electricity, or, was when I was 12 years old. 12 years old before yes. you saw electricity? Yes. Before that, it was just natural light, yes. sunlight. Yes, the sun was her light wow. by day and the moon by night. Yes. That is crazy. That is crazy. Wow, because eventually he did move you guys yes. out of that village into a, yes. a town in Belize, correct? Yes, but after they moved us from that particular family that was torturing us, yeah. um, they moved us to another family member. Okay. Um, this family member, she was very, very um, loving, nurturing. Wonderful. We received letters from my mom because after my mom took us there, she had to go back. Mm. And um, so she left us there. One of my chores was actually I had my own area to, to farm, to clean, and I had to take food for, um, and this was my grandmother, I'll say this, Grandmother on my mom's side, she was a darling. Okay. And uh, my grandfather had one foot oh. due to a hurricane. He was outside trying to hurry fix up the house and a coconut tree fell on his leg and chopped it clean off. Wow. So he, ever since he had one leg. Um, but one of my chores beside outdoors was actually to take him food. We had an outdoor kitchen and a fireplace, of course. We didn't have stove still. But um, wow. so we, I used to take him food inside. Sometimes he don't feel good, so I'd take him food inside the room or, you know, whenever, and I was happy to do it. And I remember one particular day, well, let's rewind a little bit. Um, I used to go in the room, he used to comment about my dress, oh, he looked pretty, and it's, you know, um, and I used to be like, thank you, and because my mom used to send stuff, and I used to be happy to, that I am wearing, like, you know, different uh, clothes and stuff. Right. Um, and I remember this particular day, um, I took the food for him. I said, just leave it up there. And he wanted to talk. And he was just commenting on how beautiful I am and all that stuff. And thinking, wow. that's my grandfather. I'm not thinking anything. And I remember him grabbing. Oh my god. Wow. That's horrible. Did you tell anyone? Um, no, not until I was in my 20s. Wow. He grabbed my hand and touched, like I was pulling away, and he touched my hand on his private. And this is when you were still just a, a little bitty girl. No telling, what, nine, ten years old? Yeah, so. like around nine. <clears throat> um, it's horrible. Yeah, and this went on for a long time. And I remember um, I remember I used to run away when he called me to do chores. And my grandmother didn't understand why was she always running away. So he said, well, I told her to do a chore, and she didn't want to do it. So he would be the one to end up actually get in a long, uh, from a tree, a long, t and then they would call me and hold me and, and beat me because that's the way that they do for, for somebody who don't um, uh, obey. Of course, they discipline you with a whip, but he would be the one doing it. He would be the one to lie. And I didn't have a voice because I was scared. What is my grandmother going to think? Or where, what's going to happen? If she found out, I knew something was wrong. I never encountered 
anything like this before, so there was a lot of confusion going on in my brain. I knew it was wrong, but I never knew why or, or what was. So he would say, she's being disobedient. She won't come right. to me. When only you know in him the yeah. reason why you won't go to him. Right. And as a result of that, they would have to hold you down while he can beat yes. you and for not. Right. That's, and then he sick. would want to have me on his lap. And I stopped going on his lap. And my grandmother never, you know, back then people wasn't educated to know the signs and be aware of, of child abuse and all this stuff. So she didn't understand. And she used to say, like, go sit in your, um, grand, you know, in your grandmother's, on your grandfather's lap. Let him feed you or let him. And, and I would never want to do it. And I would get, like, uh, scolding or and it would repeat itself, repeat itself until one day he got sick. And uh, my grandmother took him to the city, and I, God helped me. I used to pray. I said, I wish he never come back. I wish Ooh. that he, my grandmother came back by herself that day and told us that he had cancer of the lungs. He used to smoke and drink a lot. And I was very happy. Right. I was the happiest person in that house. Right. And um, because of what I was enduring of, of, of the abuse, um, uh, she went to visit him the following week and I told her that he didn't make it. It was too far gone. And um, I didn't end up going to his funeral at all. I was the only one that I told my grandmother I was sick. I really didn't want to um, right. be there. Wow, that was, that's horrible. Yeah, and that's when my mom came back. My mom and my, my dad stayed. And they came back. Yeah. And I know you told me after all of this, there was a point in time, I think you were about 12, where you finally got to come to the States yourself and yes, yes. be exposed to this great country. Yes, uh, I remember my mom said, oh, we, I filed for, you know, I filed for you. And I didn't understand again. She, these words and yeah. file and, but, that but was she said visa. I was gonna travel. Yes, this is after my mom and dad came. Right. We was back in the village where we originally was before okay. we ever went to any family members. Got you. Um, so the first time that we traveled, um, it was beautiful. I, I mean, I never experienced being on a plane. I was horrified. <laughs> um, we were flying over now, about to land, and the lights and all this stuff. I'm thinking we are going on another planet. Wow. Because I never knew that this place exists or any other place exists but the village mm. that we was from. It looked like uh, the inside of a, a radio. We used to open radios to look inside to see where voices are coming from. <laughs> so it looked exactly like that. A lot of buildings and lights, and I, I was wow. just fascinated with how different it was um, coming off the plane and going onto the escalator. Yeah. I remember jumping from like the fifth escalator all the way down and these people turn around and look and be like, what is her problem? But <laughs> I was scared that it takes my, take my feet. And it I didn't, take yeah, it <laughs> I didn't understand a 12 year old and I jump and slide all the way over, down and, and people looking at like I'm crazy. And I remember the first movie that I looked at. Okay. It was called The Flash. And I remember being in the theater and this big meteor coming from the sky and I had on this uh, 3D, gla 3D glasses yes. or oh, the 3D movie. And this was my first time. Wow. And I dropped on the ground and I start screaming and I was like, and people looking like shh. <laughs> but they didn't understand that this was my actually first time. And so everything was so different. Wow. The lights and the vehicle and all these houses climb up together. and. Mm. So it was something that I had to uh, get adapted to because I didn't even speak when I came here. It was, it was totally different. I was, wow. yeah. And this was you and your mom? Yes. Yeah. And, and that sounds so exciting, but I understand, unfortunately, that particular trip didn't necessarily end well. No. Yeah. Um, yeah. The first time that I actually, um, met my, my cousins, because I didn't know I had cousins. Um, cousins from Belize, they lived here in the States? Actually, there's a cousin that actually was in the military. This person was in the military, and he um, lived with his wife and two daughters. And I remember my mom and her asking me, 
you know, can you watch my kids? And, you know, he was working, of course, um, they said uh, with motorcycle or, and I said, yeah, I could watch the um, kids. I was happy, I was playing Barbies with them and, and was happy to know that I have other, fr you know, cousins and, and family. And I was, I left them in their room and I went in the room that we were staying and I was just playing Barbies and I heard the door behind me open and I was just laughing and just happy to play because I never had Barbies like that. Wow. I had Barbies that hands fall off or head fall off <laughs> and I got to put it back together. Um, and this person came in the room um, with a case and opened the case and he said, come over here. And I, I went over to Barbie, they're still playing. And he opened the case and it was a gun. So I thought, oh, he's just showing me a gun since this is my first time in America. And um, he took it out and he was just doing different stuff and he had a knife. And I'm like, okay, maybe he's showing me, you know, these stuff for a reason. I, I wasn't used to so much. So I know they were showing us stuff in the house and the light and different stuff that are introducing me to. And, um, I remember the person said, take off your clothes. And I'm looking like, what are you talking about, take off your clothes? But in, of course, in my own language. And then I thought he was joking, like, I'm not gonna do that. And he got serious. He said, didn't you hear what I said? And I said, I'm not taking off my clothes. And then I was trying to go to the door and he hit me across my head. I still have the scar in my head. He and you? Yes. His and he, fist? no, with a gun. And I remember on the floor, and I was like screaming, but he locked the door. So I, the kids was like five and four, two girls he had, and they were in the other room. And I remember him. He um, forced. In every of these situations, family members. Did your, your mother return? I'm sorry. You don't have to go into more detail. We get to point. I'm sorry, I didn't know I was gonna. No, this is horrible. You were sure? Yeah. Um, I really didn't expect this because I help a lot of people right. that actually go through this and I don't get emotional. Right. Um, he he actually forced and, and took off my clothes and forced himself on me. And I was praying, I said, God, where are you at? Mm. Where, all throughout my pain. Mm. When wow. my family members was torturing me, I said, where are you at? Mm. I hated, I hated that God wasn't there. Like my mom said, she said that God is always there, you could talk to him. And I hated the fact that this God, I start hating to even talk to him. And I said, Lord, I need you now. Like, what's going on? Yeah. I'll tour my pain. I, I talked to him. I'd never seen him. And he never came for, to rescue me. And this time, I, I, I was like so devastated. I was in pain. I, I had never seen so much blood before. And I thought I was dying. And after he was finished, he, he, I heard the, the girls crying, like he went in there, but I, I'm trying, I couldn't even move. And, and I heard the girls crying and I, I didn't know that he was actually gonna hurt them too. And when my mom and, and the other person came, he was already gone, I didn't even know that he was gone because I couldn't move. I was in so much pain. And 
and my mom came in and she started screaming and crying like, what's going on? And I had finally explained to her what happened. And my cousin was in the other room and she, I don't know what was going on because I never made it to the other room. And she started crying and screaming. And she called 911 and my mom told her, and I heard this, my mom told her, don't tell her, don't tell him what happened to Doran because we were just here for a week and we don't want to be nothing big to happen and then we stay stuck over here and, and all this stuff so my story was never told. But when the police came, um, they asked me what happened to my head and my mom said, just tell them that you, you've slipped because it was upstairs and downstairs that I fell. And I told them that I fell and they thought I was crying because of what happened to them, to my cousins. But it wasn't because of what happened to them. I didn't know what happened to them at that point. I, I didn't know until afterwards. So they did their investigation with my cousins. And uh, when the time came for me to go back, um, I still was, I was in shock. I didn't even want to talk to my mom because I was mad that she didn't tell them. They were right there. Right. And, and they didn't get to hear what happened to me. Right. Um, Afterwards, my mom had told me what happened to them, and, and so it was, I never knew, I never went back, I didn't, never heard from them, because we went back um, home, and my mom, I heard her, because the walls were so thin, you could hear right through them, what happened to me, and my dad was so horrified, he was so mad, he blamed my mom for oh. actually leaving me at the house. And these are people that you're supposed to trust, the, right. the ones that you love, that you that are supposed to protect you. Right. And and it wasn't her fault. I know that, but I I I, I wanted to, for them to hear my story. Right. And um, I couldn't walk for a while because I was still in so much pain. Um, I didn't talk, I didn't come out of my room for months. I didn't want to eat, I didn't want to hear, I didn't want to see no one. And I was just mad and so I was talking to God but I was mad at him. Cause I'm like, you were supposed to protect me. This is what I've learned, that you are a protector. Where are you at? And so all throughout my life and uh, every year we would go to the state but another state because in order to save your green card, you gotta go every year to keep it. And um, now I'm like 14, 15 years old. We're in the village of Ladyville, where there's light, electricity, and all that stuff. And it didn't faze me because I was all I wanted to do was go back to my innocent days back in the village where it was innocent mm. before my parents left yeah. us. Um, but before that, the life was so beautiful. I mean, I love waking up to the trees, to the birds, and the air, and I was so adapted that that's all I wanted was just to go back to that lifestyle. I remember the f I got a job at the radio, Christian radio station, and I was so happy. I got to like listen to all my country music and write and uh, country music and stuff. And the pastor of the church was the one that gave me the opportunity to announce because they got to hear your voice and they got to hear and uh, see if you memorize stuff or you know to follow. And I got a job at the age of like 15 years old. Wow. And I was so happy. I used to do uh, the news and do prizes and games. And, um, and then he came in one day. And I, Lord, man, I said, this pattern, what, is there a sign on me that is telling these men that it's okay to try and violate me? This person didn't uh, go to the extent because I stopped it. Um, he came while I was announcing and he tried to slide his hand up my skirt and I, I stopped him I, and I couldn't say nothing because I was mad but my voice was the only thing people could hear so I try to be as, as polite as I can and when I'm finished I turn it off but before I turn it off he was over there you, the bathroom was right across from where I sit so I could see the bathroom like the door was right there and I saw him masturbating in the hallway area and when I was finished, I turned it off, but he went out, the horror went outside. He begged me to, to take, he used to take me home, that he could still take me home. At this time, I'm trying to call my parents. 
and I can't get a hold of them. The line is one line, so I don't know if someone was on the phone or what. I tried and tried, no. And he asked me, and I'm looking to see if I know somebody who could take me home. And, it, and it's miles away from home, so I can't really walk and say I'm gonna walk because I don't want somebody to pick me up. At that time, there were so many um, women that was getting kidnapped and raped and all this stuff and, and the horror stories. So I didn't really trust to walk. So I allowed him to take me home in a van, sitting in the back seat, of course. I used to sit in front. And he took me home. I had to tell him I'm not going to tell my parents. Because I don't know what would happen if I told him I'm going to tell my parents. Right. And he took me home. And I waited until he drove off because I know my dad had a gun. I know he had guns. And ever since that had happened to me at a young age, he was very protective. He was very protective. Um, and I didn't want him to get in trouble. He was on a breadwinner, and, and I love him, and um, I loved because he passed away a couple of years. Um, and uh, after he left, I called my dad in the room and I told my dad and my mom what he tried to do. He touched me, but he didn't do anything. And my dad would rage, run out there with the gun, of course, trying to jump in his van, and my mom talked him out of it. But by the time all that was going on, a phone call we got, I answered it. And they asked to talk to my dad. And so I gave my dad the phone. I told him to come inside. Somebody's on the phone. So it was the, uh, the pastors, the head, the director, called and said that um, pastor so-and-so called and resigned, told his family what he did, and he oh. resigned. So he resigned before they could get to him. He moved out and all that stuff. And he moved to another, um, another uh, place in, country, in Belize, another village or somewhere else. Wow. And so my dad decided to actually, um, to actually build his own church. He didn't want to go to anybody else's church, so he decided that what I'll do, I'll build my own church. Wow. And so I remember uh, building his own church. Before he did that, we had like a little tent in front of the yard. Oh. And it was all children. And we'd be out there every Sunday, um, every Wednesdays for church prayer meetings. And anyone who would pass by, he would go out there and call them. My mom would cook and would, you know, give out food and stuff. And um, before you know it, the underneath the tent was full every Sunday. <laughs> and so everyone uh, would just come every Sunday and invite different people. Um, I remember for the church, we'd be out there late at night just uh, working with bricks, one person making the cement, one person wow. handing the bricks. All kids would be working on this church it was late a at night. Family affair. Yes, <laughs> so family, the church was built. Um, I want to rewind to when I was younger and that incident took place and I came back here, came back to uh, Belize. Yeah. Um, there's so many things that happened during that time after I came back. Um, I actually wanted to to kill myself. I, I remember- After the incident with your cousin. Yeah. I actually I ran away to someone's house in the city, and I already planned how I was going to actually do it. Um, you ran away as if yeah. your parents didn't know I where remember, you were? I remember I ran away. Um, I was going to climb through the window that night, but my sister, Delcia, the one that has cancer, she actually got up and she was like, Doreen, what are you doing? What are you doing? It's late. She said, get back in here. And she talked me into it. She was like, you know, it's late. People could harm you on the highway. Like, how are you, what are you doing? And she talked me out of it. I stayed. And then the following day, I, when my dad went to the, uh, work and my mom was busy, I caught a bus and I went to the city. Um, and I went to my friend's house and I asked her to take me to a certain place. Wow. She didn't understand. She thought, oh, I said, I just love nature. I love scenery. And she was going to take me, but the day that she was going to take me, um, I tried to buckle up my pants and I couldn't. For some reason, my stomach felt weird, but I'm thinking because I'm upset, I've been crying and all that stuff. And I told her, I said, can you come and help me to zip up my, my pants? And she came and I zipped it up, we got it buckled, and all of a sudden I felt like I was going to throw up. And then she said, are you pregnant? Because she knew my story, she knew what happened to me. Um, 
And I said, pregnant? I said, what are you talking about? I like, I don't think I'm pregnant. I said, my belly is not showing. I didn't know uh, how it's supposed to feel or. Yeah, you're 12. Um, and so um, her mom told me I need to take a test. I took it and I was pregnant. Um, they, from, uh, from the, uh, and um, they taught me, my, I didn't make it to where I was going. She didn't want to take me. She said, I'm going to call your mom and let her know, like, you are up to something. I'm not going to take you nowhere. And so they called my parents, and they, my parents was actually in the city, not knowing that they already had been looking for me. Um, and my mom was on the phone crying and said, please come back. It's not your fault what happened. They thought I was still just running away, trying to get away because right. of what happened to me. And I, they would be arguing a lot, too, amongst themselves. But, and I hated that I was that reason why wow. they were arguing. Um, so I found them at the barber shop. My dad was a barber in the city, and, and so he took me there. And I told my mom and dad that I'm pregnant. And my dad told me that he said, well, we're going to take care of this. Uh, you don't have to worry. Um, nobody isn't going to know. You're not going to go to no hospital where they're going to have it on the records. And, and so I didn't know. They were just taking care of everything. Um, he said, I do have a dentist. And he called the dentist. And he didn't, the dentist was the closest he could get to them with it, taking care of it. Oh, my God. And so he arranged that week for the dentist to, for us to meet. He put us in a cab, and we went to the dentist. And I never knew Belize had a basement until that day. They had a basement. We were walking down into this basement, a dark basement, my mom and I. And the guy, the doctor told me to, I have to open my legs. And I felt all oh, violated over again. And I'm like just lying there. And he, you know, I have to open my legs. And, and I'm like, oh my God, I have to go through this again. And my mom asked, are you going to give any pain medication or anything? And the guy said, well, your dad just paid $800. And that covers what I'm going to do. It don't cover his medication or anything. Oh my God. And I remember just looking at him bringing these instruments over and just like just doing the, these stuff. And I'm feeling everything I'm feeling. Like I, right now, I'm right there. And it, it was painful. It was painful. It was horrible. No 12, no one period should ever have to encounter this, but to think a 12 year old is. It was the most. It's unbelievable. It's just, and although my dad had his church and he taught us about God, I didn't, I, I just put this barrier where I didn't care about God. I, I, over and over, things just keep repeating, it felt like. And I just felt like, I don't even think there's a God. I don't think, why am I here? Like, I don't even know why I'm here. Right. It feels like it's for people to just take advantage of me or just to do whatever they wanted. I didn't understand life like my dad was saying, that trusting God and, and just, you know, go to him. He's your best friend. And, and I didn't understand that. I didn't want to understand that with everything that I've been through. And I remembered my dad want the best for us. In Belize, we have this thing most, most well, some, I should say. Some uh, people believe that you, know, you match, you put the oldest daughter with someone because the oldest daughter take care of the home. home. And they also you know, cook, wash, do whatever. I, I was taken out of school at an early age. Um, my dad believed. So you weren't allowed to graduate and finish no, your education? No, because uh, the oldest girl take care of the home. My mom was sickly. Um, and so she had operation on her brain, and a lot of stuff was going on during that time. So I was happy to do it, although I love school. And one of the things that I always wanted to do was to actually learn. I love learning. And so I was finally in school. I'm happy. I'm, um, 
learning all these new stuff that I never learned in the village. Um, right. And then I remembered my dad said, you gotta you know, stay home and take care of the home. And I remember him at the age of 15 or 16, brought this pastor guy home. Um, and he introduced me, he called me, he said, come out the room, I wanna introduce you to this guy. So I'm like, I came out and I said, hi. It was someone that I actually knew at a church that we went to before. And um, he said, oh, I want you to get to know him. I want you to get to know him. And um, I said, I, right now, I, I'm tired. I'm going to go back in the room. And I was rude to the person because I kind of figured what was going on. Wow, this was, so this was coming. You had an idea of what was happening. Most parents want you to have someone who has certain stuff to take care of you. And my dad thought I deserved the best. You know, all of us deserve the best, but he wanted me to actually... But you're only 15 or 16. Was this a young pastor? He was in his 30s. Wow. Which, and I know people that... Double your that age. ...that get married at the age of 12 to different people in my country. To so get young married age. at 12? Yeah. 12, 13, 14. But I understand... To people that are adults? Yes. And this person was actually an upcoming minister. Um, and my dad wanted me to have someone who loved God and who was going to take care of me and all that stuff. And I wasn't ready for that. So I told my dad, I'm not going to talk to him. I'm not going to get to know him. So there was this one person that was in the church that came. He was a Seventh-day Adventist. But he used to come to the church, not knowing that he liked me, but we used to talk. And uh, so I started talking to him and telling him what my dad's plans was. And he said, well, I could get married to you. And I was, at this time now, I was 17. Okay. And so we started talking and, and, um, and eventually I told my dad, I'm not getting married to that other person. I'm gonna get married to this person, which was my kid's dad. So, so you and this person weren't really dating? No. I didn't want to get to know him. I don't care about him. No, I this mean, person, the, the, oh. the, the other person was older than you too, but just not that much older. Yeah, I never, my dad never allowed us to date. Um, if we was interested in somebody, like my ex-husband did, he had to come to the house and be on the porch to talk, just talk. And wasn't allowed to go out anywhere with him unless the family was there. So you were marrying this guy to stop from having to marry yes. the older right. preacher, double your age. Yeah, teeth wow. missing and everything. <laughs> I have to laugh, <laughs> yes, but, it, <laughs> but um, So what did your dad say about that? He didn't like it. He did not like it. Um, I remember telling him over the phone. And then when he came home, he, and my heart was racing. When he came home, he said, Doran, I want to see you come in the room. And he was lying down, my mom was lying down, and they were just talking. And he still tried to convince me into the, this other person. And he knew that the other person was a Seventh-day Adventist, and he was not a Seventh-day Adventist. He didn't like that. He said, you shouldn't be mis, uh, unequally yoke and all this stuff he went through. Mm -hmm. And so I said, you're not, I'm not, you're not changing my mind. I'm not going to... I said, but I found someone to marry, kind of around that age, what he was planning to do. And I said, no. And then he jumped across my mom and almost punched me out. I ducked my head. I'm like, I was going to get knocked out that night. And we got into a really heated argument. And I remember just going to my room. And the following day, I waited until he went to, to work when I decided to call him again and tell him, you don't even know this person. You don't, get to, you don't even try to get to know this person. So I decided I'm going to move out and go with my grandmother until uh, it's time for me to get married because you can sleep with someone until you get married. And I had explained to this person that I'm not a, a virgin, not explained to them what happened. Wow. Um, but, I got you. And, uh, and got married. I stayed there until I got married. And my dad had asked to give me away, but... Um, he said yes at first. On the wedding day, he said no. So that was, I was, uh, you know, I was very sad about that, disappointed. But we went ahead anyway. So let me fast forward the story a bit for the sake of time. Because okay. this is so, so much has happened. So as a result, you marry this guy. 
and y'all moved to the States, mm -hmm. to the United States. And I understand that the marriage wasn't quite what you thought you were signing up for, even right. though you all had three children together. Mm -hmm. In a very brief synopsis, what was this marriage? Um, it, was, it was a getaway, first of all, from a lot that was going on in the home. And um, I came over here in America. Things changed. He became controlling. Um, he came up abusive. The first time he hit me, that's when I found out I was actually pregnant with, wow. um, with my daughter, Megan. Wow. First time I found out. Um, and it repeated itself, repeated itself. Eventually, I, I planned to go back to my country and run away from him. But I had to be nice about it. So whenever he would do what he'd do, I would never fight back. But I said, you know, I'm, I'm tired. I just want to go visit my parents. I haven't seen them in a while. So I decided to just pipe lock, l l pipe light clothes and, and stuff like that for the kids. I had Junior and Duran then. I mean, Junior and Megan. I didn't have Duran, so we went back to my country. And when I was over there, I was able to get a job and start over telling him on the phone that I'm getting a divorce. Uh -huh. I can't take this abuse no more. Uh -huh. And um, I started a job. One day, my dad came to the place where I was working and said, you won't believe this. He's back. He came over here, and he said that he's come. He came for you, um, and I was once again like, "Wow!" And so my dad um, told me that you know you could stay with me and all this stuff. And so I got to talk to my ex-husband, that is ex now, um, and he said that is is your mom or your parents trying to f take you away from me. And I'm gonna finish, uh, you know, I'm gonna take care of you and the kids, which is I'm gonna kill you guys if I can't get to you. This is what I'm gonna do. Or I'm gonna take, I'm gonna do it to your parents. I'm gonna take, you know. Wow. Take care of my parents because I believe that it's them that is influencing you to leave me. Wow. And so to, to not have my parents involved in this, I decided to go back into a marriage that I really didn't want to. Man. That wasn't comfortable. So how long did it take you to actually get out of this abuse? It was after, after the last, the baby. He was just a baby. He wasn't even one year old. When um, he got a chair and wanted to push it down my throat, and we was there wrestling on the floor. I remember trying to climb through a window, and he pulled me back. And it was just a lot. And I opened, I pulled open a drawer full of knives, and I grabbed the knife. Mm. And I said, it's either you going to go to there, or I'm going to go. Wow. One of us, but I'm going to go out with a real fight. And so I held a knife while Ahori went to the phone. And he's still following me, and Ahori called 911. And I told him where I'm at and what's, going, what's happening right now, and I fear for my life. And they came. When they came, um, he was in the room, and I was in the living room. And I remember them coming in, and, and I telling them, and giving them my report. And he didn't deny it. He said, yeah, she deserve a good whooping because maybe she, uh, what she need to do is either go home and learn from her parents how to be a woman and not fight back and all, all this stuff. But he admitted it. Um, I end up in court and all that stuff. And, and that's yeah. how you end up. But you end up now being a single mother with three little kids. Yes. And with you, you, you couldn't drive. You no, I didn't have an drive. education. Yeah. You, wow. I had to teach myself how to drive. Driving, I remember going to a school and getting a little, uh, uh, what do you call it? The, they give you the, like- The driver's permit? No, like when you go to school, they give you uh, this free money or something. And I said, the first thing I'm gonna do is buy a car. So I bought a car. Not oh, a loan, student loan. That's it, or yeah. Grant. Okay. And so I remember driving to school and a police was behind me. And I pull into this little department store area pretend to get out <laughs> like I'm going in the store. But that's where I learned to drive on my own. But even so, you, you figured it out how to take care of your three kids on your own. See, that's quite a lot of strength. I know there are a lot of ladies that feel stuck and don't have the strength to get out of abusive relationships. And sometimes when they're dependent. Mm -hmm. So I definitely yeah, he took admire away you for having the strength. Yeah. And so I know that there's so much in your life and people are going to have to get the book. But to conclude, I realized that you did go on to get in school and you was trying to get your nurse's degree. Mm -hmm. 
And, and I, mean, I think you were almost there. Yes, yes. You were almost yes. there. But to conclude, just tell us what happened as you were so close to getting your nurse's degree. So it was, it was three months away from me receiving my, my nursing degree. I was so happy. This is all I ever dreamed about. Yeah. So I said, I'm going to go celebrate with my two friends from uh, class. But uh, let me just stop by my sister and see how she's doing because I was trying to, uh, we haven't been talking for a whole year. Um, going there for a whole year, the front house was always vacant and she lived in the back house. So I, the gate was always open, looked like a normal day. I walked in the gate and I was about to turn the corner when I saw a, um, a, that dog, what is this? It's like a canine looking a German dog, shepherd. German shepherd. And he was sitting there, and our eyes meet each other and then we looked at each other. And I said to myself, you know what? Let me just turn around, go outside and call my sister. If she don't answer, then we'll just leave. So I, as I proceeded to turn my back, which the, I heard this big growling and coming under speed and just knocked me to the ground. Now I'm on the ground trying to protect my throat, fighting this dog that, that grabbed my, my lip and grabbed a piece of my nose. Wow. And I remember the, 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 in nursing school, I said about the juggler vein, so I'm trying to protect these. And I've, I, I just felt like to give up. I'm like, wow, this dog is so hard to get off just with, with my feet. And then I heard a voice like just, you know what? Just fight. And then that's when I, I start fighting. And I said, if you take my lip, you take my lip. But I'm, you're not going to take my life today. And I just uh, pushed the dog off me. I couldn't get to the gate on time, so I had to jump a fence. As I jumped the fence, the dog grabbed my shoes, my nursing shoes. I was still in my nursing uniform. And I, that's all I re remembered. And um, I didn't know I hit my head because I didn't remember. I just remember jumping the fence. But I, w I went into a coma for three months. And while I was in, the, I didn't know I was in a coma. I didn't know after I could tell you I was in a coma, of course. Um, being in the hospital, I remembered floating. I'm floating in the ceiling looking down with my face. And I'm looking at this person right in the chair and a doctor, but a light is around, only two of them. And she's saying, get the gauze, get the saline, do this, do that. And I'm hearing this, I'm looking at this person, look at they're in pain, but I am not feeling nothing, I'm feeling calm. And, oh. and all of a sudden, it's like, like I'm lying like this in the ceiling, but somebody came and took me like this, and I, I was small, like a baby, and took me through this tunnel, beautiful lights. And, it felt like I opened my eye and I closed it and I ended up in this place. And I was a huge giant overlooking the whole world in a white dress and it, my hair was, looked like when I was like teenage. And I was so happy, I was playing in the clouds. I'm looking over the whole earth, I'm moving the clouds and just being there. And then I decided to sit on a waterfall. It was all green, not even a brown leaf. Beautiful. It's not even as it's as it's not even bright as the sun. It's brighter than the sun. <laughs> and I was sitting there barefooted, everything natural, and I'm just like playing in the waterfalls like this. And I looked over, and a lot of people is waving. And I said, Let me go see who those people are. So the more that I walked towards them, the more that I shrink and I'm shrinking, and I'm moving closer and I'm shrinking just to the level that I'm at right now. And as I go over. Their faces look so familiar. I'm like, in my mind, I'm saying, that you, you guys look so familiar. But I couldn't put a name to their faces. Mm. And they would hug me, and we were hugging and <laughs> talking. And, and it's so beautiful. And I remember feeling this strong energy. They, you know it's God. I don't know how I know it's God in this place. Right. I knew God in this place. Right. And this is like a win, but it's strong. And I felt it. And... I'm walking all over this earth and I'm seeing people on mats kneeling and bowing down and meeting different cultures and different colors that I've never seen before and different people doing different stuff and, and praying and people praising God. There's choirs, different places, singing different music. And I remember end up to this place where there's country music and I stood there and I saw myself playing the guitar. <laughs> and I've never played guitar in my whole life. I said, oh, that's too hard, I'll never do that in this world and I'm there and there's babies there's beautiful like no no buildings no streets I mean it was no night never came I didn't know I was there for three months 
it felt like one day that I was there. Um, and it was just incredible with, with uh, everybody praising God and just so free. I've never seen no pain, so nobody how, crying. How did this beautiful utopia in? Well, eventually I felt something coming out of my throat, a weird feeling, something I never experienced before in this world. I thought that I lived there because I thought I never, well, I didn't know anything else. That's where I was from. And I, I felt this stuff coming out of my throat and I heard a voice saying, uh, Miss Dawson, you, you, can't, you won't be able to see me because your eyes been closed for so long. And just follow my, just listen to my voice. And, and I start like freaking out and, and yeah. like didn't know what was going on. Right. I thought this was a nightmare, but nightmare is not what I knew back when I was in this world. Right. And I said, I can't see you, but my mouth is locked in with these wires because I operated on my, I broke my poly, upper palate and my lip and all that stuff. And I, I was like, no, and I couldn't move my hand. I was lying there. I said, no, I can't see you. I can't see you, but there's somebody sitting there next to my, in robes. And these people had robes on, no clothes, no earrings. Everything was natural in this place. And I saw this person in a robe, but I couldn't see the face. Only the white robe I'm seeing with their hand on my leg. Oh. And I said, no, I can't see you. And the doctor's like, ma'am, you can't see. I don't see anybody there. There's nobody. I'm right there. There's nobody there. And I, and I was getting upset because I'm saying, no, he have his hand on my leg. <laughs> he, and I'm trying. He said, don't talk because you have this stuff you don't want to open. And I'm, I couldn't stop talking. I said, no, there's somebody right there on my leg. And I'm doing, trying to move my hand. And he was like, no. But when I was able to see the doctors and everybody's, I couldn't see that person. But I knew it was God wow. for the first time. I, I, my whole, this, the, the coma changed my whole perspective. I, I wasn't close to my kids, as close as I should have been. Yeah. I was more partying and going to school and working two jobs. And the right. little time that I had overs was what they got. Right. My sister, I never spoke to her, but a doctor told me that they were going to take me off the ventilator because I was there too long um, and it was expensive. So somehow my sister, my daughter got a hold of her. She came, signed and said, keep her on wow. as long as possible. So that draws closer. Wow. And I didn't know God. I didn't want to know God. Right. But he showed me so much. I was searching for, for a different religion and I'm like, oh, it's too much people believe in all kinds of stuff. But he showed me there. That's none of your business. I, all I want for you to have a relationship with me. That's all I wanted. And he showed me that he was all those stuff that I've been through. Yeah. He took me through all those, all those situations. I never stayed there. Amen. And he bought me from all those, all those horrific. It's not, my story wasn't for me. Yeah. Yeah. He was preparing me for so much that I didn't know. And so he, during the time that I couldn't walk or I couldn't talk yeah. and my daughter took care of me, yeah. I had to ask them, what was your mama like? Who yeah. was she? What is she like? Yeah. And I had to know, I had to say, you got to go back to school, Megan. You can't take care of me. She used to give me bed baths and feed me and walk me to the bathroom. And eventually, after a while, I said, you're making me feel like I'm paralyzed. Like, and we both of us start laughing. And it was just a lot that we've been through. But... I remembered going to the bathroom after she was at school for the first time. I had to make it to the bathroom because of the head injury that I got. It felt like when I'm uh, standing up, I got to hold on to stuff right. because my head, somebody was pushing me to the side. And I remember falling down in the bathroom and I was mad again. I was like, Lord, I said, why you took me from such a beautiful place that I came from? I used to tell doctors, when I got out, I said, this is a nightmare. I don't live here. I live in a place beautiful I, that God exists. And you said, God exists. We know about God, too. And it was matter. I was like, no. I said, I actually live in this place. I had amnesia for almost two years. I didn't know my children. I didn't know who I was. I didn't know what I did. I didn't know. So I had to learn myself through my kids and tell me about this person that I didn't know about. Wow. And so I'm there in the bathroom on the floor, urinated on myself, mad. And I said, Lord, why would you take me from such a beautiful place and bring me in an earth with pain? I never knew about pain. I never, I'm experiencing all this stuff that I never experienced over there. I want to go back. 
But it looked like I, I can't go back. So I'm stuck here. So whatever you want to do, just use me. Just do whatever you want with me and take full control of my life because right now I don't have no control over nothing. And so I, I meant it and I was talking to him. I said, I, I know that you exist now because I came from that place. I know that you exist. I didn't have a clue of what all that I just mentioned to you that I've been through until after my memories start coming back. Like three months after, um, I, I talked to God. And see, we don't have to close our eyes and talk to God. I, I realized that you talk to him just like we're talking right now. You have that relationship. God wanted me to have a relationship with him. So he had to reroute my whole life. He had to close my mind from the way I used to think about him. And he wiped all that away to make me know the real purpose, why I'm here, why I exist. And I know that he's here right now. He still have his hand on me. Just like the day when he, I saw that hand on my leg. Yes. And ever since I've been having, the doctor told my kids and my family, don't show her any pictures. Don't let the memory come back so we know it's real. And I remember giving birth to my kids wow. and, and having them in certain colors and they would bring the picture after I explained to them. Right. And so I knew that it was real memory coming back. And during that time, they told me I was gonna be a nurse and I tried to go back to take tests. I couldn't remember. They couldn't accept me into four schools I've tried, and I just ended up crying and disappointed. And I said, Lord, please just show me. This is where I just want you to show me what you want me to do. Not knowing that I hated psychology, he showed me this is where I want you to be. This is where I want you to change and, and help people to bring out the best in them. And so, I looked into it and I finally got into the psychology school and um, it was a struggle. Kind of doctors told me I'd never, don't ever go to school because you had water on your brain and the pressure would cause you to go into a seizure or worse. And, and one thing that I didn't know that I was stubborn, I went ahead and I just signed myself into school anyway without telling the doctors. And three weeks ago, I finished my master's. So I know that God is still able. He's still taking me through. God is and, able. And I am so happy. And I, I had to talk to God. I said, Lord, I'm so sorry for thinking that you never exist through all those situations that I've been through. And I'm, I'm so in love with God. I'm so in love with God. And now he's using you to help other people through similar tragedies, you become their hope because you are proof that it's not over. God still has a purpose despite your pain. And that's what we want you to know. Despite what you've been through, despite yes. what you've gone through, no, it isn't fair. There are evil people in this world that allow the enemy to use them. That's not God, those are evil people that are operating under demonic influences. That's not God. But God is the one that will deliver yes. you, will yes. recover you, he will restore you. Yes. And when God finishes, the joy that comes from what you get yes. ready to birth Hallelujah. will be greater than any Hallelujah. traumatic experience you ever Hallelujah. went through. Yes. He yes. will turn your sorrow yes. and your yes. mourning into joy. He will turn it all around, and he's going to, just as he did it for my lovely wife. Yes. He forever us, free. Yes. Forever free. Yes. God wants to free you. Listen to me good. If you never made that wonderful discovery of knowing Jesus in a very personal and intimate way, I want to give you this opportunity to accept him right now. Amen. Accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Only Jesus could have done for her could have turned around Amen. such a tragedy Amen. into a triumph. I'm so blessed to have such a victorious woman despite it all. God wants to do that for you, but you've Amen. got to accept him. Why don't you pray this prayer after me if you believe Jesus died for you and rose again. Say, dear Lord, dear Lord please forgive me. Please for all of my sins. For all of my sins. I know Jesus died. I know Jesus died. 
and rose again. And rose again. So I can be saved. So I can be saved. Jesus, come into my heart. Jesus, come into my heart. Make me a new person. Make me a new person. Give me a new life. Give me a new life. So the rest of my life. So the rest of my life. Can be the best of my life. Can be the best. For your glory. For your glory. In Jesus name. In Jesus name. Thank Amen. You, Lord. Thank you, Thank Lord, you Lord, for saving. If you prayed that prayer, we want to hear from you. We want to we want to minister to you. Why don't you email us at calvaryhawthorne at gmail.com and someone to help you get started along this path. Amen. If you've got prayer requests, you can send them there too. And we're getting ready to turn it over. We got Children's Church coming on at 1130 at Premier's at, children, at CBC Children's Church. And today's lesson is Noah Waits on God. Also, we got a mental health panel on this Saturday at 12 o'clock p.m. Pacific time. And the subject is anxiety and depression. Join us. We're going to be there. And next Sunday is a special Sunday. The Vibe is back. It's the Vibe Sunday. And the Cypher is back as well. It's going to be greater than ever. And don't forget the first Sunday, which is Easter, which is Resurrection Sunday for us as believers. We have a special service and we have communion at 1 p.m. in the parking lot. So come on out and join us. We're going to have a special communion in the parking lot, in your car, safe and sound. Amen. If you missed your opportunity earlier to give and you want to support this ministry, we've got three giving platforms. Givelify, Cash App. You see our Cash App name right there. And, amen, you can mail in checks and money orders as well. And also, my wife is operating in this calling, in this anointing right now. She's operating in this space. She operates right now as a facilitator. She's got a master's as a marriage and family therapist, and she's facilitating right now. She does domestic violence facilitation. She does anger management facilitation. She, I don't know how many parenting facilitation. She's got almost all the certifications. And, 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 and she can serve you right now. Her website yes. is CollinsCounselingLA.com. Look at the lower third right there on your screen. You should see it at the bottom of your screen. CollinsCounselingLA.com. And what she also does, if you don't know, when she had that ferocious attack, her friend that was in nursing home with her gave her CPR, yes. and the doctor said that helped preserve her life long enough for them to do what they did. So she's been so grateful that she's also become a CPR instructor. And if you need to learn CPR, she is a credible, amen, teacher and instructor of that as well. So you can see it's DMD CPR. You can also visit her there and go to that website and get and make your appointment. I'm yes. so proud of her. I'm so proud of her. And also the book is coming soon. Life Between Two Worlds. Life Between Two Worlds. Stay tuned. And I'll say this for her because I know she's full right now. We want to take this moment as we go to thank you and everybody yes. who supported her sister who was, who was yes. dealing with stage yeah. three cancer. Well, you know, still, she just completed her last radiation treatment. They've cleared her to fly. She's mm -hmm. going to be able to go back and, and visit, you know, see her family who she's been away from. But she wants to, you know, know how thankful yes. and grateful she is for all your prayers and support. And, of course, you know, things are still working. She's still got to come back to the doctor's appointments and follow up to make sure everything is a-okay. But we know by the grace of yes. God, she's already healed. Yes. So thank you so much. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, Sugar, for allowing God to use your, your true story that hopefully encourages someone else. Because we often yeah. want to give up on God. Right. But even then, I hope this lets you know God would never give up on you. Never. 
Amen. Father, bless us now yes. as we leave this place going to our different destinations. Yes. Keep us in your perfect will and in your perfect way. Yes, bless Lord. everyone, Lord God, and the sound of my voice to continue to walk in the destiny you've ordained and not allow what they went yes. through to cause them to deny you because yes, you weren't Father. the one that did it. You're the one that's going to recover them from it. Yes, Father in, God. Jesus in Jesus' name. name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Love you, sugar. Love you. <laughs>